the food that comes in is a lot more than just fuel. It's used as a structural component in all of our cells. It's used for hormonal production. It's used for all sorts of things. And so just because we have a fuel does not mean it's going to become energy. The main place it's going to go if it's not going to be converted to energy or if it can't be converted to energy is to body fat. If we improve our conversion from fuel to energy, that's going to help reduce the amount that's getting stored as body fat, and that will help us lose body fat. And instead, on the flip side, if we're not effectively converting that fuel to energy, if that's happening at a much lower rate, a much lower efficiency, then there's going to be a lot that's going to be stored as body fat because our bodies aren't using it as well. Now, there are a couple of different fates for the substrate other than being converted to energy or body fat. One of those, as we were saying, is excretion. So after the food gets absorbed, there can be excretion back, you know, basically through the liver, through the bile, back through the digestive system. There can be excretion through the kidneys, through the, uh, into the urine. As I was saying, we can breathe substrate out. So we want to account for the fact that that substrate can just leave the body through excretion. We also want to recognize that in the process of converting, of absorbing the food, a portion of it does not get absorbed and instead gets excreted through the stool. So we're going to add an arrow there to account for that. And then the other place that substrate can go is to structure. So as we were saying, that's things like muscle, bone, skin, every part of our bodies, our organs, all of those are made up of substrate from food. So that is one other place the substrate can go. It's also worth mentioning that in the same way that we have a bidirectional relationship with the fat stores, where we can be storing substrate as body fat and also releasing fat from the fat stores to be used as fuel, which could then technically be structure, could be excreted, or it can be used to produce energy. The same thing can happen with our structure. So we can break down muscle, bone, skin, organs, and then we use that as substrate to then uh, typically, you know, produce energy or even to be stored as body fat. You know, those are all possibilities here. Now, as far as the fate of the substrate and which way it's actually going to go, we'll talk about one of the main ones, which is how effectively we convert it to energy. That's really going to dictate then how much gets uh, stored as body fat or what the other fates are. Now, when we're talking about energy, there's a couple of places that we use energy, and I generally separate it into two different categories. One is our external energy demands, and this includes things like exercise or movement, psychological stress, our ambient temperature. This is all of the things that basically we add on to our just baseline needs, right? This is all, you know, anything that we can uh, that, that isn't just, you know, our basic organ function and things like that. This is all the things that can change in our environment that we need to use to produce energy or that we need to have energy to, uh, to use, to basically, uh, make up for or account for these demands, to be able to move, to be able to deal with stress, infections, things like that. And we also have what I call our internal energy demands. And this is our basic kind of organ functions, things like digestion, detoxification, uh, you know, breathing, our heart pumping, uh, you know, regeneration of, of tissue, all of those things require energy. And so that's going to be our internal demands. And obviously the, these two things can, what affects each of them will change, right? So we have typically more control over our external demands, right? Whether we're moving or not, uh, what kind of things we're exposed to. Whereas our internal demands are, they're not fixed. They can change a lot, but we can't choose whether we're going to increase or, or decrease them, right? We can choose what kind of temperature we expose ourselves to, to an extent, but we can't choose whether or not we want to increase our detoxification systems or not. There's no getting around it. If we ran five miles, we have to put energy to that. But if there's less energy available, then we have less to go to those internal demands, less to go to all of the, uh, you know, our internal organ functions and things like that, which is where we can start to run into issues because when we turn those things down, A, it's, that's generally what we call turning down our metabolic rate or our metabolism, uh, but B, it comes at a cost. It means we're not detoxifying as well. Our immune fun function isn't working as well. Our digestion doesn't work as well. Our cognition doesn't work as well. So that's when we start to have issues. And this is really, as we'll get to, really the main place that if we're limited in terms of energy, we're going to be reducing the amount going to the internal demands, which comes at a major cost. So as I was alluding to, there is a really important distinction made with this approach, which is that this, the fuel that we have from the food, or we'll call it the substrate, doesn't automatically become energy, right? There's an important difference. There's a distinction between the substrate or the fuel and the energy, and there's a lot of steps involved there. And it's this is, I would say, really the central part that dictates what's going to happen in the system is how well we're converting that substrate to ATP. Now, there are a number of things that are involved there that will affect that. 
But in general, what we're talking about here is basically our mitochondrial function, right? The mitochondria is where we're producing the vast majority of our energy, whether it's from glucose or fats or amino acids, other intermediates. And that's where we're going to produce most of our energy. And there's so many ways that that can go wrong, right? There are tons of enzymes that can be inhibited, whether it's due to a lack of nutrients that are needed for them to function, whether it's due to oxidative stress. Our hormones have a major impact on what's going on in the mitochondria. Stress and stress hormones are going to have a major impact here as well, which we'll discuss. So this is really the central piece. If this is working well, then we have a lot of energy available to go to our internal and external demands. Also, it means there's a lot less substrate that will be stored as body fat because most of it is getting used to produce energy. We'll also talk about how this turns down our hunger, so we're not going to eat extra, and we're not going to have this all this extra substrate there to be stored as, as body fat. So this is really the central piece that, as we'll talk about in some of these next uh, examples, if this goes wrong, this is when we're going to start to store body fat, and we're going to be excessively hungry, and we're going to be decreasing our metabolic rate and basically decreasing our structure, you know, causing degeneration, as well as reducing the functions of, of all of our internal systems, which we definitely don't want. So let's assume we have 20 units of food here. We're just going to go with arbitrary units. It's a little bit easier as well because, uh, you know, 20 is a little easier to play with as opposed to 2000. So we've got 20 units of food. Of those 20 units, 18 get absorbed and become substrate internally. Two of them get excreted. So this means that they are not digested and they pass through uh, you know, undigested and, and through the stool. So at this point, we have 18 units of substrate available, let's say for the whole day. And during the day, there's always going to be some amount of release from the fat stores, even if we do nothing, even if we're at rest, there's always going to be fatty acids being released, uh, triglycerides, fatty acids being released from the fat stores that we can use for structure or to be excreted or to produce energy or to be circulated back and restored as body fat. But there's always some baseline amount. We're going to assume that in this day, that amount is four units. So on the whole day, we have about 22 units of substrate to play around with. Of those 22, one gets excreted, let's say through the urine, through the skin, through the breath, all of that. And seven goes toward structure, right? This is for maintaining our bone, skin, organs, things like that. So we're now at 14 units of substrate left. Of those 14 units, 10 of them go to producing energy. And we're going to say it's a relatively decent efficiency. In this case, we're in balance. So this is an example where we're not having any storage of body fat or loss of body fat. We're in balance in terms of our body fat stores. So of those 14 units of substrate, 10 goes to producing energy. And of those 10 units of energy, five go to our internal demands and five go to our external demands. And then we have those four units of substrate left, which gets stored back as body fat. So in this case, everything is in balance. We're covering our demands. We're covering our structural needs. We've released some body fat, stored some body fat, so that's even. And this is an example of what it would look like if we're in balance. Now, let's say instead of being in balance, we're gaining body fat. What would that look like in terms of you know general idea of what's happening? And then we'll put some units to it. So we have our same, you know, backbone here, but if we're gaining body fat, there's going to be a reason for that. And the primary reason is going to be that there's impaired energy production. Basically, our mitochondrial function is not ideal. There's impairments there. It's not as efficient as it would be otherwise. This could be, again, due to nutrient uh, deficiencies, due to hormones, due to stress, due to endotoxin, heavy metals, infections, tons of different things can affect how well we convert uh, the food or the substrate into energy. But if this is impaired here, we're not going to be producing as much energy as we would with the same unit number of substrate, right? So instead of producing 10 units of ATP from the 18 or uh, 18 that were left, or was it 14 that were left uh, after excretion and structure, instead of producing 10 out of 14, we might only produce 8 out of 14. And if we wanted to get to 10, we would need to have more substrate available because this is not working as as efficiently. It takes more substrate coming in to get the same amount of energy. So if we have the same amount of substrate and less is being converted to energy, not only are we going to have less for our internal demands, but we're also going to have more being stored as body fat. So let's put some numbers to this to uh, make it a little bit easier to follow. So we've got the same 20 units of food coming in, 18 go to substrate and two get excreted just like before. And then we have the same four units coming out of the fat stores. So we've got 22 units of substrate available and we've got the same one that gets excreted, seven that goes to structure. So we're left with 14 now as substrate. 
Now, as we said before, instead of 10 of those units being converted to energy, now we only have eight units that get converted to energy because this efficiency has been reduced because we have impairments, we have blockages in the mitochondria. So what we have the same external demands, right? We moved the same amount during the day. We had this, you know, around the same temperature, same stress, things like that. Uh, so we will have five units going to the energy demands, the external energy demands. But that means we have less left over. We only have three left over to go to the internal demands. So instead of the five that we would have had, we're left with only three there. What that means is that's less energy to go to all of those internal functions, to go to digestion, detoxification, uh, breathing, cell turnover, immune function, all of the things we discussed. So that's the first consequence. Now remember also of the 14 units that uh, of substrate that we had, only eight went to energy, which means there's an extra six available, which then gets stored as body fat instead of the fours before. So now if we look at those fat stores, four was four units were released, but six went in. So we've gained two units of body fat. So in this depiction, we have less energy, less going to the internal demands, and we have more being stored as body fat. We actually have a net body fat storage. So what are the consequences here from the impaired mitochondrial function? We have less internal function, you know, basically a decreased metabolism of three units instead of five, and we have the storage of body fat. And those two things go hand in hand. Those two things go together. Now, the assumption from the calories in, calories out people, the people who are generally misapplying it, is they say, as soon as your energy stores get topped off, then all the extra substrate goes to fat. But what they're not recognizing is that the, you know, they're assuming that substrate conversion to energy is just perfect. There's nothing that changes that, but the reality is everything in our environment changes that. So there's massive opportunity for things to go wrong there. And that's when we have extra substrate going to body fat. So a couple of really important points here, energy and body fat storage are often uh, inversely related, right? If energy is higher, as we'll get to, body fat is lower and vice versa. If energy is lower, body fat is higher. And of course, if you're in a state like this and someone just says eat less, and then you have even less uh, energy available and even lower uh, metabolic rate, even less energy going to your internal demands, you're going to be in an even worse spot. And maybe you'd have one unit less of body fat, but you're going to be much more likely to continue storing it because your metabolic rate is going lower and lower. Plus, you'll be even hungrier and hungrier. And we'll get to the hunger in a moment here. But first, let's provide the opposite situation of how we could have fat loss and what that would look like with the energy balance approach. So we've got our same backbone here, but instead of impaired mitochondrial function, instead of an impairment in the conversion of substrate to ATP, we have improved mitochondrial function. You know, our nutrient status is great. We have low levels of endotoxin hormones. You know, we've got high thyroid and high reproductive hormones, low stress hormones. So this is going really well. So we have an increase in efficiency of conversion from substrate to energy. And we actually have less substrate available then to be going to body fat. So again, more energy, less body fat because of improved energy production, improved mitochondrial function. This will also mean increased energy available to go to our internal demands or external demands if we wanted. But the benefit really comes from the internal demands more than anything. And one thing that we won't talk about, but just kind of came up now as a, as a thought, you know, people will talk about eating less food. And as I said, if you eat less, you're going to have less energy. You might have a little less body fat storage, but it comes at a major cost. If you increase your, your external demands by exercising more and keeping the food intake the same, it has the same consequence, right? There's still less energy available to go to those internal demands. You're still taking it from your metabolism. You're still taking it from all of the internal functions that you need. You're still depressing your metabolism over time. So whether you're doing it by eating less or by exercising more, if you're not actually fixing the mitochondrial issue that's underlying the body composition issue, you're going to have the same negative impact over time. All right, so here we're talking about the opposite. We've improved our mitochondrial function. We're going to talk about what this looks like with units where we're, we're eating the same amount. We have the same amount coming in. And of that, 18 units is going to substrate, two is going to excretion. We have the same amount coming from the fat stores of four units. We're not doing anything to increase the release of substrate from the fat stores. Uh, we're not, yeah, we're, we don't have to focus on that at all. That is not at all necessary for losing body fat because there's always a baseline amount. Of course, you, it can be increased, but oftentimes in the case that we're increasing it, it's because basically we're in a deficit in terms of energy, a real energy deficit, not a calorie deficit. And when that happens, 
there's actually an increase in, you know, we have to get the substrate from somewhere. Either it's going to come from body fat or from structure. We'll talk about that. But in the case that we're in a true energy deficit, then we would rather get it from fat than structure. But that's only happening when there's actually an energy deficit there. So we don't want to focus on releasing fat from the fat stores. Anyway, we're left with our same 22 units of substrate, just like before. One of those goes to excretion and seven goes to structure. So now we're at 14 units of substrate available. But instead of 10 of those going to energy, because we've improved our mitochondrial function, 12 of those units go to energy production. Again, we haven't changed our external demands, so those will still be five. But our internal demands, now there's extra energy to go to those. So instead of the five units that went to the internal demands before, we have seven units there. And again, the same five to the external. What that means is we now have more energy available for things like immune function, for things like digestion, for things like cognition, for uh, you know anything that we want. And this acts as a signal to raise our metabolic rate, to further improve our mitochondrial function, and to store less body fat. It reduces the hormones that lead to body fat storage, but also there's less substrate there available. We only have two units now because of the 14, 12 went to energy. There's only two units left to go to body fat. So now we're at a, a basically a fat deficit, right? We've lost body fat here, two units of body fat, while having more energy and raising our metabolic rate. So this is what we're going for. This is the way that we would want to actually lose body fat, not by forcing the increased release of body fat, not by consuming less food, because those will both come at a cost. We'll get into that in more detail, but instead by improving our conversion from food or, uh, to substrate to energy. If you enjoyed that clip, you'll definitely want to download the free Energy Balance Food Guide. The Energy Balance Food Guide will help you determine exactly what to eat to optimally support your metabolism and help you lose weight, improve your digestion, get amazing sleep, boost your energy, and so much more. The Food Guide makes it extremely easy to get started with a bioenergetic approach to optimizing your health. So head over to jfeldmanwellness.com guide to download your free Energy Balance Food Guide.